What's up guys, your host and humble narrator Buck Johnson here and you might notice this recording sounds different than the usual podcast and that is because I'm sitting outside here in Lockhart, Texas recording this ad into my iPhone. It probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something very cool. Many of you guys know that my production team works over at Podsworth Media and they've been producing my show for quite a while. I get a lot of questions and people asking who does your podcast? Why does it sound great? And I'm telling you why. It's because the guys at Podsworth are amazing. They've got this brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this and making them a whole lot cleaner and more listenable with just a few easy clicks. It will remove background noise it reduces plosives, it fixes clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, clipping, which is distortion from recording with the gain up too high, which I can promise you I've done many times, and they fix this for me. It removes clicks and pops. It removes clicks and pops, and then also levels out the dialogue, so there's no crazy where the guest sounds too loud or the interviewer sounds too quiet. Here's what you guys can do. All of y'all that are interested in recording podcasts or audiobooks or anything, if you're a pastor and you want your sermon recorded, whatever the case may be, go to podsworth.com and click Get Started. You drag and drop your audio files or click to open your file manager. This also works on your smartphone's web browser. You customize your settings that you want, but the default works fine on most podcast recordings. Then enter code BUCK50. B U C K five zero for fifty percent off of your first order. You don't need an account, just an email address and payment. And you'll get a download link in your email for your cleaned up files. How cool is this? The guys at Podsworth run everything they do through this app before they do anything else to it. So all of my recordings go through this app that we're talking about. It works great. Like I said, any spoken word recordings, obviously for podcasts, YouTube videos, sermons, audiobooks, whatever, it will make awful recordings sound listenable and much more professional. So, like I said, go to podsworth.com and click get started. You can use promo code BUCK50, B U C K 50, for 50% off of your first order. You can use promo code BUCK50, B U C K 50, for 50% off off of your first order. Let's get it. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram brass, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Hope you're having a great week. If you're Orthodox, hope you're having a good Holy Week. If you're not, hope you enjoyed your Easter weekend this past weekend. We got ours coming up. And if you don't celebrate it at all, well, just keep listening to the show because it's a good one. You're going to enjoy this guest. He's quite the character you're going to see. If you have the ability to watch this on YouTube, I recommend that because Father George, he's a character and you're going to enjoy this one. If you don't usually do that and you, it's something you're interested in, just go to the YouTube page and subscribe and you'll get all of the updates that we do on there. And I should say, speaking of that, there was a lot of good comments on the YouTube page for last week's episode. I appreciate that. I think a lot of y'all felt the same way I did. What a huh, crazy story from Joseph Shamba, the guest last week. Of course, Julie Mastrini, the wonderful co-host, was a, a bright spot of the episode and the ending was a bright spot. Joseph's story at the end finally became good, but man, he has gone through a lot of tough times in his life and I, I appreciate that he was so open with all of the details of those things. And yeah, it looks like you guys felt the same way and I appreciate all of those comments on the YouTube page. And also, I always tell you all about this, but more and more people roll in every week. So I don't know if I'm wearing you down or sometimes you skip through this intro or you miss an episode or two, but we do have this club at patreon.com slash counterflow. 
where if you just sign up to donate to this show, $5 a month or more, you're in the club. And like uh, most of y'all who are in this club know, last month we had our special guest on the Zoom call was David Patrick Harry. He got into a lot of things that he can't normally get into because he's out on YouTube. My show's on YouTube. We're podcasters. But the cool thing about this club is the Zoom call that y'all will be a part of with our guest and myself. It's not recorded and it's done. It's not published on any platform whatsoever. It's a private conversation between the guest, myself, and all of y'all in this club. There's a lot of Q&A going. And I know the people that were involved got a lot out of that, as did I. So I have a person in mind for this month for the Zoom call for the Patreon donors. I better contact this person ASAP because before I know it, the month is going to get away from me. It's Holy Week here and uh, a lot of people get busy during this time. So I'll do that. Again, that's at patreon.com slash counterflow. Now, let's get to this episode. Father George Hill is quite... The character. He's uh, a man's man, as you're about to find out. He's a lieutenant colonel in the army. He's the chaplain in the army, too. We discuss some of those things, but we get into this problem with masculinity in our culture these days. It's gone for the most part. A lot of you, if you work with or you see or you know the younger and younger generations of young men, young boys, you're starting to see that. It's not exactly our father's and grandfather's generation, is it? So we get into the who, what, why, where, and all of these things surrounding this crisis of masculinity. The spirit of masculinity has escaped us, it seems, these days. Why has that happened? Is it by design? What problems does it lead to? Is it in the church? Is this an issue in the military? Or is it just regular America? Maybe it's beyond America. Is it the West? Is it the East? We get into all of that with my guest this week, Father George Hill. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Thank you. Um, I'm uh, doing well. Good to be here. feel like uh, Josiah Trenum or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, one day it might be him on here as well. Uh, and it's also, I mean, I, I'll call you Father George, but it, you, you're you also known as Lieutenant Colonel Hill. Is that correct? Uh, I'm a Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Army Chaplain's Corps, yes. Gotcha. Okay. Well, there's obviously then there's there's a few titles you go by and there's a lot of aspects to who you are and what you do that we'll get into. But I guess before we jump into that, give my audience whatever intro uh, you'd like to for yourself that they'll find pertinent for this discussion. Uh, well, I'm a Orthodox priest in the Orthodox Church of America uh, with the St. T. Cons Theological Seminary. I uh, graduated back in uh, 2006. I've uh, been an uh, active duty army chaplain ever since. Um, before that, I was an attorney. Uh, I was practicing law in Tennessee, assistant VA in Chattanooga. And uh, I was in the Army National Guard. I was an Army officer and then a, uh, a uh, civil affairs officer with 12 Special Forces Group from 9 11 kicked off. Um, but uh, that's my my background. What a lot of people won't know this. I know because of my job. Uh, I'm a firefighter, and and I suppose military people will know this. What what does a chaplain do in in the armed forces? So a chaplain is a uh, pastor to the um, the organization. So uh, of course, I guess if you have a uh, a firehouse, um, you're for uh, your chaplain, uh, where they have like fire brigades or something like that. There, there are formations of firefighters. Yeah. Uh, that particular formation, or be a chaplain, he's a pastor to the to the the firefighters. Um, same quote uh, in the army. Um, each battalion has a as a chaplain, it's a pastor to the to the battalion. We see chaplains in hospitals. Yeah, uh, and among police departments and. Uh, in some kind of an official capacity, uh, they have a, a minister that ministers to the uh, men and women that serve these folks and uh, they serve, serve the country or serve the, the community. Usually so, in, my, in, our, in my case, it, it must be a little different because 
you're on a military base out there, I assume. And but w when we encounter the chaplain uh, in the fire department, it's usually for something that bad that's happened. Like uh, it's a funeral very often. Uh, well, that happens in the, in the army, uh, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, chaplains are with, um, well, we're not just on the, uh, on the base either. We deploy, uh, with units, um, typically do whatever the soldiers are doing. Uh, if they're jumping out of airplanes, I'm jumping out of airplanes with them. Uh, if they're downrange, I'm downrange with them. Uh, in Afghanistan, I would often go in convoys with, um, with soldiers and they'd leave the wire. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, kind of feel like, like, um, the example for the chaplain was Christ. He, uh, he was with the church or the fishermen went. Mm -hmm. That's where he was. So, uh, and they don't typically like being left alone with no ministry. Um, we, we do, we've done next of kin notifications, uh, funerals, um, baptisms, weddings, um, counseling, oral confessionals, any number of folks, right? In, in that military presence and in that military environment. Is there, the way it works with us in the fire department, there's, I don't even know at this point, there's a few, there's a Catholic chaplain, I believe, uh, like a Baptist chaplain. Um, there was an Anglican one, I believe. Is there several different, I don't like to call orthodoxy a denomination because it's not, but outside of you, are there other denominations of Christianity or, or Christian chaplains? Uh, uh, yeah, obviously, 70% uh, of the chaplain's core is uh, Protestants. Okay. Evangel. Um, and then there are, I think there are uh, seven or eight Muslim chaplains oh. in the army. Okay. There are seven of us Orthodox priests. There are, uh, there's a, even a couple of Buddhist chaplains running around. Wow. Okay. Uh, I had I had no idea. Do, have you had soldiers come to you and say, what is this again? Orthodoxy. I, you know, uh, this isn't what I grew up with. And, and have you had them curious about what it is and end up converting or anything like that? Um, so. I do not proselytize the Orthodox faith in, uh, in the army. It's a pluralistic environment. Yeah. And, uh, they have, uh, everyone has a first amendment right in the army. So, uh, it's inappropriate for me to run around and try to convince people to become Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got nothing to sell. Uh, you know, uh, the Orthodox church. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of times I tell people, hey, uh, not not for nothing, but the, the, the Orthodox Church don't need you, bro. Mm. You might need the church. Yeah. Well, no, uh, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, Jesus, Jesus don't need you. Uh, you might need Jesus. Uh, um, but uh, no, occasionally, um, probably two or three times a year, I have a... Uh, I've got a, a soldier knocks on my door, comes to my office and says, are you the Orthodox priest? And I'm like, yeah, no, yeah, I am. Okay. Because I've been reading about that and I'm interested. Right? Oh, okay. That's happened as long as I've been in the army as, as a, as a chaplain. Anyway, <laughs> um, the, the, I mean, these are individuals who have, you know, come to the conclusion that they're looking for something that ha and they found it in orthodoxy, right? Mm -hmm. Similar mm -hmm. to you and I, I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think, uh, the rest of them, um, a lot of them don't know what orthodoxy is, but among the chaplains, everybody knows what orthodoxy is among okay. chaplains in the army. They're very familiar with it. Um, Everyone that goes to the chapel officer basic course is a brand new chapel. There's usually an Orthodox priest there. Okay. So, um, it being a pluralistic environment in the civilian world, that you're a, a evangelical Protestant minister, you're likely to never see an Orthodox priest. 
Right. Ever. Right. Whereas in the army, because it's a pluralistic environment, everybody sees each other and everybody works together to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, we develop friendship, friendships and professional and collegial relationships mm-hmm. uh, with, with all sorts of different people. So um, it's actually a, a really good opportunity in a really unique environment that you wouldn't see in civilian world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, has the incoming uh, recruitment class over the years, and obviously I, I understand you can only answer this may, maybe guarded or a certain way, has the incoming recruitment classes in the military, has the demeanor or the attitude or the look of the soldiers changed since you've been in? The attitude? Um, attitude towards something in particular? Because, j- because there's a outside of the military, I'll, I can give you my perspective, um, uh, th- th- but I, this seems to be across across the board in, in this country, but it uh, does seem that the military is pushing um, kind of a more woke style of, of demeanor on people. But this is happening again. This I've seen this in the fire department and I've seen it. I've seen police departments try to recruit this and advertise this. I've seen the CIA advertise it. Uh, yeah. um, that type of thing. Have you, have you seen any of that? You know, I, I really don't get involved in recruiting. Okay. Like at all. Uh, that's a whole different section of the army. Uh, and it's a very small section of the army. Okay. Uh, there are retention, um, in Sierra's retention efforts. Um, but as far as the recruiting thing, you go to an army recruiting office and then you go to the army. That's, that's a different world. It's it just is. Two, I- different, two very different places. And I just don't, I can't even tell you the last time I saw an army recruiting office. So I really wouldn't be able to gotcha. comment on what they're doing. So right. you probably know as much about it as I do. I mean, I see the news and stuff. Yeah. Okay. But you don't necessarily see that on the ground where you're at. I do not see that on the ground among soldiers. They, they, they really look like, uh, uh, and then there are, there are different, um, cultures within the army culture too. Mm. Uh, like, like many different cultures. There's the combat arms culture. There's the, uh, the special operations culture. There's, uh, support and combat service support cultures. And they all have different flavors of, of people. So there's the intelligence community. Yeah. The intelligence community and the infantry community. Very different communities. Okay. So, um, the majority of my time in the army has been spent with, uh, with the, um, with the, the combat arms type folks. Got it. Okay. When we spoke on the phone the other day, we discussed what I would call, we didn't necessarily title it this, but I would call, and it's something I've focused on on this show from time to time, a crisis in masculinity, oh. broadly speaking. And, and I said, uh, we, we talked about it within orthodoxy, within Christianity, within, yes. and I said America, and you said, th- this is not just American. This is in the West in no, general. No, it's Western civilization. Yeah. yeah. It's Western civilization. So this is a, uh, um, obviously a question for Father George, not Chaplain Hill. Um, right. So, um, yeah, this, this, uh, this is a, a, a theological question without a doubt. Um, and it really goes back to uh, the original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, there is very interesting lecture series by a Roman Catholic priest by the name of Chad Ripperger that you can find on YouTube. And I would uh, recommend um, folks that are interested in this topic take a look at this. Uh, and, and the uh, lecture is called Raising Men. Raising Men. Um, and he looks at, uh, has a very interesting take on, on Genesis uh, chapter 3 the, w- w- with the original fall. And I kind of uh, take a look at that and it makes, it makes sense to me. Um, and if we think about it, God created um, uh, man and he created woman. Um, 
And there are two accounts for that, actually, in the scripture. Uh, the second account, the Lord takes the rib from uh, Adam's side, fashions woman out of that, right? Um, he's not good that, that man would live alone. And the man had a role in that marriage, and the woman had a role. And what we see, as Ripperger explains, is that both of them rejected their role. Mm. Uh, the man had the role of leadership, um, and the woman had the role of um, of completion or of life giving, of life bringing. Um, so the man had also the role of responsibility, and the woman had the role then of submission. So what happens is both of them rejected their role. Um, Eve did not follow Adam's lead. She wanted Adam to follow her lead. She ate the fruit, came back, gave it to him. So here, eat this. And he says, yes, ma'am. <laughs> he submits to, to, to Eve. Um, then he eats the fruit too. Afterwards, Adam, uh, the Lord comes looking. He doesn't come looking for Eve. Right. He comes looking for Adam. Adam, what what happened? Adam refuses to take responsibility. He refuses to um, he refuses to man up, if you will. Mm. Um, and we call this the the Heisman in the army. Ah, uh -huh. pushing it away. Yeah, eyes went off to this guy. Oh, not me. Hit him yeah. right. Well, the eyes went off to his wife. Oh, not my fault. You giving this woman here. Interestingly enough, um, this typology of the old Adam and the old Eve is um, is corrected with the new Adam and the new Eve, yeah. right? And they fulfill their roles. Um, the new Eve is is the mother of God, the Pharaoh Tokos, uh, as a young girl. The Archangel Gabriel comes to her and says, uh, uh, you, you'll, you're going to conceive. And you're going to conceive out of wedlock. And um, goodness, as a young girl in, in that area of the world, in the Levant, in the first century, um, that, 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 that's a rough, a rough concept. Um, best case scenario, uh, she asked him, it's going to be exiled. Try to make, maybe ask to live a life as a prostitute or something. Worst case scenario, she's going to get stoned, right? So a great risk to herself. She says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word, right? Where her mother, the oldie, says, be it unto me according to my word. And when the old Eve says, be it unto me according to my word, she gives birth to generations of dead children. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she commits the original act of abortion when she does that. She kills her children. But the new Eve says, be it unto me according to your word and gives birth to children that will live forever. So there's the juxtaposition right there, the correction that happened. The new Adam is the Lord. Um, he, he uh, accepts his role and he takes responsibility. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I will die for them. I will die for them. Um, and as a result, the world is saved. So it makes you wonder what would happen if Adam and Eve had just done, done that in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the Lord, uh, takes on the full role of masculinity, which is, which is meekness. Mm -hmm. And meekness is a very misunderstood word. Today. Right. So we get, I grew up believing that meekness was weakness. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not, there was nothing weak about almighty God at all. Um, Christ did not display Weakness ever, if not once. Uh, he was so powerful that he controlled the seas. He controlled nature. Um, 
didn't it? She even uh, arguably lost his temper when he flipped over the tables of the money changers in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Uh, made a made a uh, uh, fashioned a, a whip out of ropes and and commenced to whipping some ass. Is exactly what he did. So, what is meekness? I really like Jordan Peterson's definition. He says meekness is a sheathed sword carried by a powerful man that knows how to use it. So, mm. what is meekness? Meekness is a very powerful man who is capable of violence. This man is capable of mayhem. You don't mess with this guy. But he is likewise at the same time guided by moral virtue. Okay? The weak man has no no, no moral virtue. His mm-hmm. any virtue he may have is irrelevant because he can't do anything about it. He's stuck with being a nice guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's stuck with uh, being ruled by powerful men. Right? So, no, you can't be a weak man. Uh, it's impossible for a weak man to have a little virtue because he just can't do anything about it. Mm. Um, and we, we can look at the Athenians at Miletus during the Peloponnesian War. Um, if you recall, the Athenians were at war with Sparta. And they went to Miletus and the tiny little island up in the Cyclades. And the army rolls up and says, hey, we want you to... Uh, we want to enlist your aid in fighting the Spartans. And they said, well, we don't want to. They're a bunch of philosophers. We don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want to go to war, right? And he said, they said, okay, cool. You don't have to want to, but you're going to do it. You can either do it voluntarily or we'll just conquer you, make you our slaves, and, and, uh, and then you'll fight with us anyway. And, of course, the philosophers are like, well, what kind of deal is that? That's contrary to to uh, the laws of 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 um, humanity, and they said there's only one law of humanity: the strong do what they will, and the weak do what they must. Mm-hmm. So um, that turns out to be, yeah, the law of the fallen world: the strong do what they will, the weak do what they must. A weak person can have all the moral virtue they want, but it's irrelevant; they can't do anything about it. But the strong person with moral virtue can exercise that moral virtue against uh, against evil. So that is a requirement. Um, that's just a requirement. A man has got to be strong in order to be a man. Now, whether he's morally virtuous or not is up to him. Yeah. But um, no, we, we we need to raise our sons to be very strong and very powerful and to be capable of mayhem because if they're not, there's no moral virtue can be exercised by them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've done a show or two on this topic. There's from, from my perspective, there's a very, uh, a large amount of weak men going on. And like you said, whether, uh, they have moral virtue or not, who who cares because they can't use it. And then there sometimes can be this, this almost mirrored uh, opposite of the same type of negative energy where it's like some guys will say, oh, I'm macho and I can tell a woman what to do and I'm, I'm the boss, I'm in charge, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost a faux uh, masculinity, but they have no moral virtue. Yeah, they're just a bad guy. Yeah. They're a bad man. So there's yeah. there's there's not enough of the in between part the the royal path as some people call it where sure. you have well, the, Aristotle called it golden mean yeah um, have you seen that the the opposite thing that I'm talking about where it's this kind of faux masculinity and the, there so well yeah we see this in uh, in Western civilization now Western civilization is currently in the middle of this grand experiment. Um, which is the same thing that happened in the garden. Uh, Western civilization would like to make, would like to feminize men and masculinize women. Yes. Uh, and o- on the midst of this, if they dysfunction of, um, uh, uh, well, it's, it's the original sin, 
really, um, it, it goes back to that on the rejection of God uh, and the rejection of, of reality. So there is a crisis of reality, the philosophy of reality in our civilization today. Um, when we reject God and we embrace secular humanism, the only reality becomes us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, 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 a symptom of postmodernism. Yes. And postmodernism um, really starts with the advent of the Intercontinental Railroad. When uh, we changed, we came up with this notion of time zones. Mm. Right? So, uh, you know, trains would leave New York City and go to San Francisco. And so they had to make train schedules. Well, when it's like it's uh, here in Hawaii, it's going on uh, 8 in the morning. And what time is it in Texas? <laughs> Luckily, much later than that. 12.50. 12.50. Okay. So uh, this notion of time zones happened when they started making trend schedules. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the advent of technology, before postmodernism begins, truth is external to us, right? We operate under, under truth. It's external, right? It, it, the, the creator mm -hmm. gives us truth. Well, when it's dark outside, it's dark outside. Well, Thomas Edison created the light bulb. Next thing you know, we can play our football games at night time or in the daytime. Doesn't matter. We'll decide when it's light outside or when it's dark outside. We'll decide what time it is. Has nothing to do with the sun. We'll figure that out. Mm. We can go from point A to point B, long periods of distance, relatively quickly. Um, you want cold food? We got refrigerators. You know, we we've got air when it's hot outside, it doesn't have to be hot outside. We'll decide what the temperature is. And it'll adjust my thermostat. So more and more, uh, and, and all these technological advances are great. They make for uh, a much more comfortable living. And uh, they're good. They're blessings. But when we decided that we were the creators, truth became internal to us. We yes. will decide what truth is. And as this goes on, uh, we don't need God. We have us. We have mankind. So we embrace our secular humanism. Um, and the philosophy, interestingly enough, really kicks off after, after uh, this technology picks up. And the philosophy shows up with uh, really with the, the, the Germans in the 19th century. Nietzsche and Heidegger, um, Freud. Um, and then, of course, March and Engel mm -hmm. right, kicks this off, kicks off this notion of secular humanism. Nietzsche says, we've killed God. Yeah. He's dead. Right? We have us now. And what happens when people start thinking like that? Well, the 20th century is the rational conclusion of this type of secular humanism. We've never seen genocides and mass killings, and mass murders, governments killing their own people, like we saw under Hitler and Stalin and Mao and um, Pol Pot. Um, all of this happens, interestingly enough, post-Industrial Revolution. Yeah. So that is the, when there is no God, and there, are, there is no archetype of truth, love, and beauty, well, we've, we, we've got this age where the only truth is power mm. and, uh, and, and the only good is getting power and holding it. And um, it really doesn't matter how that happens, mm -hmm. right? So um, part of that big experiment is making men, women, and women, men. <laughs> what? So then we have a generation of men who have no moral virtue because they're weak. They're just yeah. weak ones. They, they, they cannot prosecute moral virtue. They cannot stand as paragons of virtue. Um, and that's the great experiment because these, uh, this secular humanism wants to make it the way they want to make it. So we'll make, we'll masculinize the feminine and 
feminize the masculine. And that's what we see. Uh, that gets, um, that dogma gets preached to us from every thing we see. Uh, television, ads, social yeah. media, movies, yep. um, all that stuff. And people buy into it. Um, the sin of the effeminate is uh, what Daniel Ripperger calls this, effeminacy. Effeminacy is when a man refuses to do the arduous. Mm. When he refuses to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and we see too many men, they don't want to do the hard stuff. They want to sit around and, and play video games yeah. all day long. Yeah. And live in their mom's house. That movie, uh, they, they want to be... Um, uh, in Wedding Crashers, Will Ferrell, Chaz. Yeah. Okay. Mom, we love. Yeah. We love mom. Right. And they want to run around and, and crash weddings and have sex with a bunch of different women. They just want to fulfill their own passions. They're worshiping their own passions and fulfilling their own flesh. Yeah. So, yeah. The, the uh, secular humanism is nothing more but a, uh, idolatry of the flesh. Yes. And when we do that, well, we see where it goes. So yeah. we have a generation of men who are weaklings. They have no moral virtue. They, they, they refuse to lead. They can't lead. And uh, the world around them falls um, perpetually. Yeah. And that's where we're, we're stuck. Uh, what's needed is a generation of godly men who submit to no one except God. And they are strong and they are powerful. And uh, and they are men of moral virtue. So, and that's, there's a vacuum of that. There is. Right now. Yeah. It's a vacuum uh, in Western civilization. And, and you know, the, the church in the West it's in Western civilization. It's a vacuum of it in the church. So uh, it's very sad to see. And um, and uh, the, the generation of the beta male, um, and they're not leaving anybody. No. Except to hell. Yeah. And there's there's been an increase in mental illness, depression, and things of mm. this sort, which I, I suppose could be the natural consequence of, of this, of exactly what you're talking about. Weak men, angry women, etc. Yeah. Well, the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it, it just is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, life is hard, brother. Um, uh, you're a firefighter, right? Um, we're having a discussion about, uh, about life being hard. That's the bad news. The good news is you get to pick your heart. Right. Okay? Right. It's um, it's hard to run hill sprints. Right. It's hard to get in the gym. It's hard to PT yourself till you puke. It's hard to eat properly. Um, it's hard to do that. Man. It hurts. I'm 54. I'm still doing it. Run up <laughs> this hill. Uh, I get nasty side stitch. My Achilles heels flare up. Yeah. You know, that's hard. Yeah. But other side of it, it's hard to have type two diabetes. Uh -huh. It's hard to have inflammation in the joints. It's hard to be overweight. It, it, it's hard. That's a hard way to live. So the fact of the matter is in this fallen world, brother, you are going to be disciplined. You're either going to discipline yourself or the fallen nature of this world is going to discipline you. Right. Um, I'd rather discipline myself, to be honest with you. Yeah, I can turn that off whenever I decide to. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. When the when 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 you're being disciplined externally, uh, you're sucking, man. It's hard to be you. Yeah, it's, but it, but we see, and that's a discipline from the mind. It's a discipline of the soul. It's a discipline of of, of the body. Uh, Paul talks about this. I bring my body into subjection. Have to, have to, because that's the flesh. That's the sarx. The sarx attaches to the soul at birth. And wants to destroy the soul and take the soul to the grave with the flesh where it's destined to, right? So, 
uh, as as um, Christ assumed our nature and turned it the other way around, but to eternal life, we have to do the same thing. Otherwise, we're destined for the for the grave. But that's the ultimate thing, man. Life is hard, but you get yeah. to pick your heart. That's a right. statement of Christianity. Yes. Choose your heart, man. You know? There is so much awful propaganda aimed directly at your children. With these two books I'm about to tell you about, you can at least help open up their mind to better ideas, not these crazy, progressive, poisonous, toxic ideas. My sponsor, Ollie Adamson, has created two wonderful children's picture books. The first one is called Strawberries Are Red, a story about compelled speech. It was inspired by a work policy restricting the use of gender pronouns during performance reviews. Leftist ideologies, and you guys know this, are heavily subsidized and continually thrust upon our youth by the media and in their schools, unfortunately. There's never discussion of ideas that occurs, and that's by design, right? Because they know their ideas will lose in an open discussion. These books promote conversation between parent and the child and incrementally tip the scales toward reasoned discussions of the topics at hand. The other topic we're going to talk about here in this ad, this book is called You're Not Welcome, a story about segregation. Sound familiar over the last few years? This was inspired by a work policy that actually placed Ollie, the author, on unpaid leave for five months due to medical mandates, we'll call it. This story presents and uses racial segregation as a backdrop before moving on to the issue of medical segregation and these policies that we all saw over the last few years. It takes no position on the safety or effectiveness of either masking or jabbing, but instead focuses on coercion that was used to achieve the establishment's goals. You can check these books out at ollieadamson.com. That's O-L-L-I-E, Ollie, and then Adamson.com. Com. They're also on Amazon. So once again, the books are called Strawberries Are Red, a story about compelled speech. You're not welcome, a story about segregation. I'm so proud to do an ad for Ollie, and I'm really glad he's sponsoring this show because these are very great books to get the young one in your life. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, and it's very much, I mean, I, I can see everything you're saying through an orthodox lens as well. Prayer rules are hard. Fasting is hard, but these yeah. are things that we do to become more disciplined uh, ascetically and, and, and things of that nature. And you can these are easily. Things we do to kill the flesh. Mm -hmm. Kill the flesh and make it what it was created to be. Right? This, this, this body was created to live forever. We were created for eternal life. Um, these things. Uh, that are hard are always good. You know, we're I'm working out with my son uh, <clears throat> in there lifting. I'm trying to explain to him to do these lifts strictly. And the general rule is, hey, is it harder that way? Well, yeah, dad, it's harder this way. Okay, if it's harder, then you know you're doing it the right way. Yeah. But does it hurt more? <clears throat> good. You're doing it the right way. Yeah. But these things, <clears throat> these things are good. Does uh, I mean, there's an old saying, right? When you get done working out, if it hurts to tie your shoes, you're doing something right. Mm -hmm. the same thing with uh, you know, with your prayer rule. Uh, if it's difficult, you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but <clears throat> like I said, we've got a generation of men that refuse to do the arduous. Yeah. So, and, and when they are given the responsibility of leadership. And they refuse to do the arduous, um, a a everything falls behind them. Uh, everyone that they're supposed to be leading falls, mm -hmm. right? And so there, there's no way that it works. It, it, it's just dysfunctional. So we're going to run off with this great woke experiment in our country. Um, and uh, there's nothing to fear from it. Uh, a lot of people, I, I hear a lot of fear. Right. Oh no, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Oh no, we're doing this. Oh no. Uh, what was us? Well, Alistair McIntyre, that great British philosopher, says the truth always prevails in the end. Always. So yeah. if this, if this secular humanist woke stuff 
if it happens to be true, well, great. We have nothing to fear from it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. If it's not true, well, we'll we're going to figure that out at the end of this experiment. You know, there's a reason why we put parachutes on when we jump out of airplanes. Mm-hmm. The reason why you put oxygen on when you go into a burning house, right? Mm-hmm. People have tried it without the oxygen before. It didn't work out so well, right? Hey, right. you know what? We put this oxygen on, though. We can go in there and we hang out a lot longer, mm-hmm. right? We put this fire retardant material on, right? There's a reason for that. Truth prevails in the end. So, but that took some experimentation, I assume, right? <laughs> right. On fire departments. You know, they had to figure things out, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I guess we're going to experiment with this great progressive stuff and, and and see where it goes i don't really i think it defies all logic and common sense but you know if you were to run that way um i guess we'll figure it out so yeah. not something we need to be afraid of um i mean god's not giving us a spirit of fear anyway um it's a little bit disheartening but at the end of the day hey brother don't do you mm-hmm. do you think man Hope it works out. That was an interesting thing you just said. God's not given us the spirit of fear anyway. But is the spirit of fear a, a demonic inversion of what Christ gave us, an energy from him? Uh, well, yeah, it's a dysfunction. Of, um, it's a, uh, it, it's a, a, a adoration or smoke and mirrors. You know, evil is, a, it's like a funnel mirror in the fun house, right? It's a distortion of truth. Yeah. So no, evil has no essence in it itself. Mm-hmm. That there is, it's just like neither does darkness. Right. Right. But there's really no such thing as darkness. It's just an absence of light. Mm-hmm. So evil is an absence of of the uh, trifecta of truth, love, and beauty. Right. And so if we have truth, uh, and this is this is Aristotelian. Uh, well, not just Aristotelian. It comes from Socrates and Plato as well. But the um the objects of the trifecta of the universe and of reality for them was truth, love, and beauty. Um, interesting how it, how it uh, sets the stage for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Correct. Right? So um, truth is, is reality, okay? Uh, love is the energy of truth. Mm-hmm. And beauty is the expression of truth. You see? Mm-hmm. So, uh, just as um, the Father begets the Son and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, the <laughs> same can be said of truth, love, and beauty. Wow. You see? So, yeah. these are, uh, it's why I've always, and man, when I say this, people, some, some folks uh, lose their minds. Um, the uh, the Stoic philosophers, uh, they, they, they are the other Old Testament. Okay. They, they, they set up the... Um, Philosophical framework for the seven ecumenical councils. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they've set they set all this stuff up. Uh, I mean, there's a reason Stoic philosophy ceases to exist after the second century. They all became Christian. Oh, okay. It, it uh, I mean, Christianity spread in um, two very uh, very large and profound environments. Uh, environment number one, or demographics, if you will. A demographic number one was the Roman army. It had spread like wildfire there. Demographic number two was the philosophy clubs of Alexander and Egypt among the Stoics. So it 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 it, it just a, a fact, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um matter of fact, there are uh, churches or, or Catholicons at Mount Athos were uh, on the outside of uh, the entrance to the Catholicon. There are icons, if you will, of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle pointing the way mm-hmm. inside the church where you have uh, where you have the saints, where we have Christ, where, where you have God. This, this was uh, seeing through the glass dimly, but soon face to face. The mm-hmm. whole notion of logos, right? Yeah. Why did, why, did, uh, why, why did the apostle John in his prologue, why did he talk about the logos? Yeah. That was not a Christian term. That was not a uh, that was not a, a, a term in Judaism at all. That was a Greek philosophical term, <laughs> right. right? And he says, "O logos sargs et yenato," the word flesh became. Right. I had a seminary professor, Doctor Christopher Nimmerman, said that there 
are uh, those are the most profound words ever spoken in human language. Wow. A logo starts at Anato, right? So uh, foolishness to the Greeks, because why would the logos descend and put on uh, our flesh, which Epictetus said the body was a rotting corpse of the paltry pine of blood. Salvation was getting rid of this thing, source of all evils, right? It was weak and it was servile. And all it does is make the mind chase the passions, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so uh, salvation was getting rid of this body. Why would Logos put one on? Right? Foolishness to the Greeks, right? Scandal to the Jews. But uh, they figured out that, um, well, the Logos put that on out of love and out of a longing for intimacy with his creation, right? To redeem that, that humanity, to redeem that body by assuming it, right? And perfecting it. Mm -hmm. Show us the way to perfection. Way to perfection is being what you're created to be, mm -hmm. as opposed to committing ontological suicide by a man wanting to be a woman or a woman wanting to be a man. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. So, um, and, and that, that's just what we see is the expression of that. And we see it in the church, man. Uh, and we shouldn't be surprised to see it in the church now. The church is a hospital. Yeah. I mean, are we surprised and walk into a hospital and see sick people? I want to be here a bunch of sick people. Right. You know, I came here because I was sick and all the people here are sick too. Well, yeah, man, you're in a hospital. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we shouldn't get disheartened when we see that. A church is a sanctuary for sinners, not a house of the holy. Mm -hmm. You know? So, but, uh, in order to heal, yeah, we've got to have leadership and um, men need to step up and, and, and stop being beta males and stop being effeminate. We see it in our seminaries. We see it, uh, everywhere. Um, a lot of people in the army, well, they think chaplains are weird. Um, you know, they're holy Joe with these, uh, handing out candy and hugs and, you know, a, a feminine mousy man. Um, <laughs> and, you know, this is a, this is something that happened in the last 40 or 50 years, I guess. Okay. Right? Um, I got a, um, uh, my, my father, he was a Baptist minister. Show my uncles and uh, great grandfather as well. Well, they, they, they were tough guys, man. You didn't mm -hmm. mess with them, mm -hmm. right? And, and and now uh, it's a little bit different. Yeah, I hear all the time. You don't act like a chaplain. You don't look like a chaplain. You know, like right. yeah, well, I'm not that kind of chaplain. Man. I'm not that kind of priest. I'm not that. I don't, no, that that's actually for a long time. I would say, well, I guess I'm not a very good priest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can act like that. Now, the more I look at it, I'm like, you know, people that act like that are very good priests. Uh, there was a monk at Mount Athos that told me and a buddy of mine, a fat priest is no priest. Mm. So, how can you stand up and be a 400 pound ranger and tell people they need to live the ascetic life? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Hopefully I'm not going all over the place. In this no, discussion. that's good. It reminds but, me of when I was in the fire academy, we used myself and the other cadets would make fun of one of the instructors while we were doing push-ups in perfect form. He's had a chicken wing and he was yelling at us to, to be disciplined. With his chicken wing? In his yeah. That's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and to this day, 25 years later, sometimes I'll see some of my classmates and we still bring that up. Uh, you know, bring that chicken wing. Yeah, 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 and and it's the same kind of thing. We're thinking yeah. this old guy who's snacking on a chicken wing, telling all these young kids to to look better Try and be to do more their fit. Push -ups. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we see uh, that same metaphor in, in a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, the priesthood, huh? Yeah. So Where do you, you chicken you, wing you, while they're hey, uh, you need to live this ascetic life. Yeah, you uh, do see that in seminary mean? school too. Seminary? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, quite disconcerting um, in a number of cases. I almost left seminary. Um, almost left seminary on occasion in my first year. 
That would have been 2003. Okay. I have heard, I, d- I have not experienced this because I've never been Catholic or even been immersed in any sort of Catholic culture, but some Catholic people I know that have since become Orthodox have said the Orthodox priests have a lot more masculine energy to them and the Catholic priests seem soft. And I don't know if that's just their experience or have you seen anything of that sort? Well, you know, you, we got to avoid, it's very easy to paint with a large, uh, the broad True. brush, right? Right. And we're not trying to make, you know, as soon as, well, one person paints with a broad brush, the other person counters with uh, an argument made by exception, right? Well, Correct. it's not true in all the cases. Yeah. And, and, and so starting with that preface right there. Um, so let's just look at the Catholic priest, uh, the, the whole notion of it in the first place. The guy can't have a wife. Right off the bat. Mm-hmm. So any man that has testosterone or has a testosterone driven sex drive and uh you know wants to sleep in bed with a woman, uh he's not gonna wanna be the priest necessarily. You know, I mean I don't know about you, I kinda like having a lady around the house. Yeah. I uh, yeah. remember um that movie Nacho Libre, that's a, a favorite of my, my kids. Okay. Right? The older ones anyway. And uh, you know, Jack Black is this monk in Mexico, but he's in love with uh Sister Incarnacion, right? And um he didn't really want to be a monk. He was just raised in the monastery and they just made him a monk. Then he runs into Sister Incarnacion and and uh uh he's fall in love with her, but he didn't know what to do about this now because he's a monk. He'd have to break his vows and she'd have to break her vows. And, and uh, he's um, talking to the orphan and explaining how being a monk is great. He says, yes, I get to sleep alone in the bed the rest of my life. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, but if you want to be a Catholic priest, that's what you're going to be doing. So... How many uh, uh, a strong, a virile man want to go be a Catholic priest? <laughs> Fair. Yeah. So right off the bat, um, you are dealing with men who essentially have no sex drive. They are lower in testosterone. Mm. Uh, and testosterone is the the the, the manly. The, the masculine hormones, mm-hmm. right? Uh, heck, you take more testosterone and you hit the gym, you get bigger and stronger, mm-hmm. right? It, 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 you take less and you have a greater sex drive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so why would that be surprising to anyone that these men who are Roman Catholic priests have uh generally speaking, um, lesser masculine qualities. Mm -hmm. It stands to reason. Um, But that is a very broad statement because uh, most of the Catholic priests I've seen in the army are pretty mental men. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty pretty fearless. Um, Yeah, studs. Uh, Friends that I've had. Um, and the Catholic Church is also now allowing, there's been a couple of converts among chaplains in the army that I know uh, that were Episcopal priests and they had they had a wife, and they had kids. Catholic Church allows them to come and be a Roman Catholic priest. Okay. And they can keep their wife. So right. we see that oh, from the time. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, but that's obviously rare. Yeah. That's not necessarily the paradigm, you know. Does that answer that question? It does, no. yeah. That was good. And, and I have one that's been on my mind and you're obviously now the perfect one to ask this to, because it's the last few years it's been on my mind. Uh, what would you say to a young, let's say 17 year old Orthodox male, Orthodox Christian male 
who is interested in joining the military? Uh, I think we have to start with our paradigms, right? Um, service to service to your society, service to the people around you, service to something that is bigger than yourself will always be virtuous. Okay. Um, because you've got, you've got two, um, opportunities. I can go into the world of business and I can serve myself, but mm -hmm. the objective there is to make money. Mm -hmm. Uh, or I can go serve something larger than myself. Um, I've got a 25-year-old uh, son. He's an infantry officer uh, in the Army. Um, and, and you're talking to a guy, to uh, I'm of Scots-Irish descent. Um, you know, I grew up, my entire family, if you haven't served in the military, or you're not a fireman, or you're not a police officer, or if you're not serving in some mass role, you're not a man. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time in this country where uh, you couldn't go get a job unless you'd unless you'd served a military. Yep. Um, you know, come up and apply for a job. Well, uh, you get your military service done. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about a job here at the bank or whatnot. You know, that was just sort of expected of a man, and that's that's a very Celtic mindset. Um, but we are. As time goes by, uh, and we become more and more multicultural, that 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 feeling is going away. The very interesting book out there by uh, James Webb, a former senator from Virginia, former secretary of the Navy, uh, called uh, "Born Fighting," and uh, it's it's the subtitle is "How the Scots Irish Formed America," okay. and he's talking about the Celts. Uh, they came over in droves by the hundreds of thousands in the 8th, 12th century, right? 1720s to 1780s. Um, and how they essentially formed what we call now the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. right? um, names like MacArthur, Atten, Jackson, mm -hmm. Lee, um, these types of um, uh, coming through uh, the the Ulster plantation, um, I my my family originally is from Ayrshire in Scotland. That's the same uh, county that Robert the Bruce and William Wallace come from. Okay. So, um, and then moving into Ireland uh, to during during the I believe it was the Hundred Years War when um, uh, the English Crown was trying to figure out if it was going to be Catholic or Protestant, mm -hmm. right? So these were all covenanters in, in low country Scotland that were um, hardcore uh, Bible thumping uh, Calvinists from John Knox's uh, background. Um, they did not like kings, no king but Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And they did not like uh, cardinals. So uh, to show their disdain for the Catholic Church, they would put red collars on and they would say, I'm my own cardinal, right? Mm -hmm. Red collar, they start calling them rednecks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there you go. Mm -hmm. Rednecks. And the other word that the British had for them was crackers. Mm. Right? The British called these Celts crackers, the Irish and the Scottish and the, and the Welsh. Um, not a lot of uh, good feelings between those two different cultures. Um, so uh, the British had been trying to subdue these Celts since. Uh, since General Hadrian or, or Emperor Hadrian built Hadrian's Wall uh, and in Scotland, because everything on the other, on, on the other side of that thing were these crazy Celts, right? Mm -hmm. these, these crazy Scottish picks. Uh, so eventually, um, you know, we have the whole war with uh, the Scottish Revolution, things of that nature. You have William Wallace, Robert the Bruce. Um, eventually, they send these folks over to fight the Protestants. Um, and, uh, and they get left out to dry 
from the siege of London, Derry, and, and then they say, we hear about this new land. Let's go to this new world. We can go be free over there. And, and they come to uh, America on these ships. A lot of them were indentured slaves. Um, but they show up and, and they won't let them into any port because they hate the Celts, except Philadelphia, the only place they can come in. And they go into Philadelphia. They go down the Great Wagon Road, which is essentially I-81 now into the, the Piedmont United States and they just keep on going. But this was a a group of people that believed that military service was a priority. And that that is what you owed. That would be my starting point right there. Okay. Um uh where the, the, the country is going, I mean in our in our uh country under the constitution, yep, we uh we obey the, the or, or, or the people that run the military are the politicians. It's always been like that. Uh, if you don't like the way the military is going, well, elect the new politicians. Yeah. Um, so, but what we don't do is just back out. Uh, we don't, we don't just back out and say, oh, well, I don't like the way it's going. So I'll not participate. I will not do my duty. Right. Um, if the country is that bad, and if it's irredeemable, um, well, go live somewhere else. You know, um, it's a it's a sign of effeminacy, I think, to what you're taking it to. Mm-hmm. I want to live here. I just don't want to mm. participate. Okay, I want to get all the benefits of this of this place, and I want to sit back with my freedom of speech and complain about all of the things that are going on on my social media account while I sit down in my basement, uh, my, my, my parents' basement, I'm 30-something years old, I sit in my parents' basement and yell at my mom to bring me more meatloaf. <laughs> right. Right? While I opine on social media and complain about this, that, and the other. You know, how about, uh, how about go be a part of the solution? How about get involved? How about be a leader? You know, get out of your basement, get some sun on your white skin, mm-hmm. put a rock on, lift some weights, go be a man. And you know what? Maybe, maybe you can be a leader and change some things. Or you can, you can get out. I, I mean, goodness. Um, brings to mind right off the bat. Um, Theodore Roosevelt's um, speech is not the critic that counts, mm-hmm. right? It, it's uh, not not the the guy that sits in the stands and talks about how the strong man failed, mm-hmm. right? The credit belongs to the man in the ring, right? So the folks that sit back on social media and, and type away and complain about everything, well, they're a bunch of critics, mm-hmm. right? Um. What did he say at the end of it? it, it it's, it's pretty profound. Um, the, the credit belongs to the man in the ring whose he, he, face is marred by blood and sweat and dust and tears. Um, who, at, um, at the greatest, knows the triumph of high achievement. Uh, or worse, knows that he failed while failing greatly or while daring greatly. His mm-hmm. place shall never be with those cold, timid souls that know neither victory nor defeat. Right. Um, so be a man. Uh, best way to be a man, join the army. Serve your country. Go be a cop. Go be a fireman. Do something. Do something scary. Mm-hmm. You know, do, yeah. do, do something that requires you to be terrified. And learn how to left, right, left, right, and do it anyway. Yeah. You ever go into a burning building? Scared out of your freaking mind? Not now. Imagine. <laughs> I mean, I imagine have. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I don't want to go in there. I might like, freaking die. A whole to death. Right? And you do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Just left, right, left, right, do it anyway. Um. I, I think there's a huge majority of men out there today that have never been truly terrified in their entire life. 
Yeah, it shows. They didn't know what it's like. Yeah. Worst thing that happened to them is they, you know, they lost their video game. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, they can't sleep at night because their football team didn't win the national championship or something. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, no, I think uh, also when, when, when Christians leave an organization, they leave a, a, a vacuum of virtue. Mm. Whenever, yeah. whenever, whenever they depart, there, there, there's a vacuum of virtue, and it's uh, what's left. What's left? Mm-hmm. Right. So um, we don't have success when righteous men do not act. Goodness, Edmund Burke. How many times have we heard this? All that's required for evil to prosper is for good men to do nothing. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times have we heard that? Everybody's heard that. I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds cool, but uh, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm told by some anything that requires discipline, Buck. Yeah. Uh, there's this hill outside of my house, about 100 meters long, steep. I don't want to run up that damn hill, brother. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. It sucks. I'm going to be breathing hard. I'm going to get side stitches. I don't want to do it, especially on if I'm if I'm uh, fasting mm-hmm. on carbs. You know, I'm burning fat. Uh, I'm eating a low carb diet. I'm the energy to run up that hill. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go to church on Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, that alarm clock goes off. I live in Hawaii. I can count about a hundred hundred really good reasons why my time would be better spent somewhere else. <laughs> You know, I can think of a hundred good reasons why I should not be running up this hill. You know, uh, yeah, we can come with all kinds of good reasons not join the yard. You know, pick your pick your your reason. Oh well, it's look at their recruit. Oh, look at the government. Oh, look at the this that and and oh, look what they're doing. And man, we come with all kind of cool stuff. Uh, yeah, I got really good reasons why I should not man up. I, I, I'm how many reasons did Adam have? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I ought to eat this for. Uh, I mean, my wife brought it to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah, hey, serpent gave Eve a whole bunch of good reasons why she should. Mm-hmm. Look, there's always great reasons to not do the arduous, to not do the hard thing. Yeah, right. Um, there's great. We you ever see the icon of ladder device? Yeah, I have it. Okay, yeah. So at the bottom of the ladder, you got all these monks sitting down there. Monks and priests, and they're all looking at the ladder, and they're all talking about it. They're pointing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all talking about the reasons why they're not getting on the ladder. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, that guy, guy fell off. Mm-hmm. Right? I didn't right. get on that ladder. Well, probably none of them are saying that they're not going to do it because they're scared. They're coming up with moral and philosophical rationalizations why they refuse to get on the ladder. Right. You know? Yeah. And it's just like, hey, bro, shut up. Get your ass on the ladder. Yeah. M- move out. It, it, it's uh, it, it's fine. Uh, C.S. Lewis's Great Divorce. Are you familiar with that book? I'm familiar with it, yes. Yeah. I uh, strongly recommend that read. That is a very, uh, th- that is the best description of the Eastern understanding of, of heaven and hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this book, you know, the, uh, the, the gates of hell are essentially locked from the inside and people can let themselves out and go to heaven whenever they want to. Mm-hmm. They just can't bring themselves to do it. Mm-hmm. And so there's a bus station and it takes these people to the outskirts of heaven and, and they go there and, and they're all standing on outside of heaven, looking into it, and all have a great reason why they're not going to go in there. Like, well, so and so is in there, and, and and that person was a despicable person. If they're in there, I want nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then there's a philosophy professor, and he's philosophizing about everything that's going on in there, and he can explain it. He knows all about. You know, he's a professor. He's smarter than the rest of us. So, uh, 
and he explains what's going on, right? But he ain't going in. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's not going to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and these beings of light that are in heaven are beckoning, saying, come on in. Enjoy this paradise with us. No, they're not going to do that. I mean, you ever thought that people don't want to go to church? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, they got all kind of great reasons, don't they? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm not doing that. It's this and it's that and it's the other, right? And uh, yeah, we, we've got all kinds of excuses for doing the thing that we're afraid of or doing the thing that we require work or suffering or discipline or pain. Yes. Um, we do not control the government. Nobody in the government controls the government. I don't know that anybody ever has. I don't think there's ever been a king in the history of the world that has controlled his kingdom. Mm. He, he can't do it. We can control what we do, though. Mm-hmm. Right? You go and you get involved. You provide some leadership. You bring some virtue. Uh, the fundamentals, and I mean the fundamentals, the non-political fundamentals of the army are the army values. All right? I'll name them off to you. There's seven. You tell me which one uh, goes against uh, the orthodox understanding, okay? Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, personal courage. We don't like any of them in orthodoxy, do we? Hmm. Those are all bad things, aren't they? Mm-mm. We wouldn't want to wouldn't want to do that. Um, that is the ethos of the army. Now, do we do it perfectly. Oh man, we don't do it perfectly. Fully humans like everything else. I tell you what, there are people that do though. There are people that do, and those folks are leaders and they are icons. We don't do it perfectly in the church, right? At all, right? right. Period. Uh, the same reasons that people do not want to join the army are the same reasons that people don't join the church. Same reasons. But come up with all sorts of well, look at what look at what's going on in that Orthodox church. Yeah. There there's schism between uh uh Russia, Russian patriarch and the ecumenical patriarch. It's not very Christian, is it? Mm. I don't know why you join that one. Boy, how many more can we come up with? Mm-hmm. We sat here for another hour. I bet you we'd come up with all kinds of reasons why we should not be Orthodox. Yeah. You know, but can't get away from the fact that it is the church represents the fullness of the truth. Can't get away from that. Um, goodness. Uh, what does the National Guard do? Well, national disasters or natural disasters happen. Floods, whatever. Those folks are out there stacking sandbags, trying to save people's lives. Well, we wouldn't want to do that now, would we? <laughs> They'd rather sit back and talk about the, 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 their woke agenda. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to go help them stack some sandbags, but I'm going to sit back in my basement, holler at my mom to bring me some meatloaf, and uh, type away on my social media account, talk about how well. Yeah, the, they're, they might be stacking sandbags today, but look what they've done here. Look what they've done there. You know, it's, it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you want to, um, if you want to live in this country and uh, accept the benefits of it, um, then be involved. If not, we've got it. It's not very expensive to go live in Costa Rica. Right. Yeah. You no, know, I think you can get down there on about a $200 plane ticket from pretty much anywhere in the continental United States. And you can live down there for probably a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. And a number of different places you can work nice, live in a, in a resort community almost. Mm hmm. Plenty of things that you can do, right? Um, so a lot of people are, are, are trash talking our country. Um, 
how do people get aggravated? I, I do. We all do. But, but um, bottom line, uh, let's see. Let's see why you shouldn't be a fireman. Uh, mayor. Mayor uh, of your town. Right? Right. Politician, huh? You follow the orders of a politician. Right. Right? Yeah, you shouldn't be a fireman then, huh? You ever, you, you agree with that politician, everything that politician does? No. Nope. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> so, that's not the point. Right. That's a good point. Right? That's, that's an excuse. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, not saying military service is for everyone. I'm saying it's for a lot of folks. Right? We, we don't solve problems or fix issues. We don't win football games by getting off the football field because mm, we don't right. like the coach or the right. announcer. Right. But, and that, that there's no sense in that. You know, um, it's easy to quit, huh? Yeah. It, it's always easy to quit. So, um, I think I, I stayed away from getting overtly political. Pretty good in that discourse. You did, yes. I think so, but I, I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm a preacher by trait. Huh? Um, I feel like I'm on my soapbox right now. Well, to your point, through most of that, my, I, one of the wise phrases my first lieutenant ever told me was, "Never underestimate the power of the human mind to rationalize." Ooh, and, I, I think that Yeah. And that's, it's so true. And it's stuck with me for 20 something years now yeah. because I, I, I still tell myself that the other day it was pouring rain and I pulled up to the gym and I almost turned around like, ah, I don't want to go in here. It's raining. It's nasty outside. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. I've already parked. Get your ass in there. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I've got a little trick that I play on myself. Um, I think the, uh, the scariest thing odds uh, ever done well they they go hand in hand uh, they, there are two of them uh but the scariest thing that terrifies me is jumping out of an airplane um 54 years old still find myself doing it um and um i i, I uh went to jump school originally because i thought it would be cool you know all the badass dudes <laughs> wearing their jump wings, right? These guys are freaking fearless, right? Went out that bird the first time, scariest thing in the world. I had no idea it was going to be that violent. Like a, um, <laughs> people ask what it's like. We're like, well, you drive your car about 130 miles an hour down the interstate, roll down your window and flick your cigarette butt out. And you're the cigarette you're butt. You're the cigarette butt, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's incredibly violent and it's scary. The ride was deployed, ripped my helmet off my head. Um, and then I hit the ground really, really hard. <laughs> and I laid down there and I made the rational decision that jumping was not for me. And I was not going to do that again. Never. No way am I ever going to do that again. That was absolutely too terrifying. Um, but I remember my son told me he hit the ground. The first thing he did was throw up. Mm. It was that scared, right? I'm laying on the ground. I'm like, yep, this is obviously not for me. This is for heroes who are utterly psycho. Anybody would want to do this. So now all I got to do, I mean, I've already decided I'm not doing it anymore. Now I just got to figure out his horrible way to quit. Mm. So that's when my mind went to work. And I could not figure out an honorable way to quit. I've been terrified doing it ever since. Mm. Um, but I guess I am uh, I, I'm too afraid of my conscience. And, and I think that there's something to be said for that. There um, is, yeah. George Patton, when he was Lieutenant Colonel Patton in the same Mihiel offense, he was given nine months to create the Army's first tenth attack, and he did it. And they deployed. Uh, on the St. Lee Hill offense, September 1918. Anyway, they got mired down in the mud. And those tracks got stuck in the mud, and they just became stationary artillery targets. Mm -hmm. And I think he took 70 to 80% casualties in that battalion. 
And so he was doing his after action uh, report to his commander, who was Colonel Douglas MacArthur, mm -hmm. was the brigade commander. MacArthur says to Patton, why did you not retreat? Why did you not flee the battlefield? And his answer was, I don't know, sir. I think we were more afraid of our conscience than we were of the enemy. Yeah. How about that? That's good. And what I tell people when I give ethics classes, when I talk to soldiers, two main takeaways I want them to have. Number one, have a very well-informed conscience. Inform that conscience every day of your life. Two, be a coward to that conscience mm. and nothing else. Mm. Nothing else. And it's not just because that's the right thing to do. If you are a coward to something other than your conscience, you're going to suffer for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it moral injury now. That's yep. the clinical term for it. Yep. Um, and that's really hard to pull off. You can come to confession and like, hey, but Jesus forgives you, ma'am. But you've forgiven yourself. That's another matter. Yeah. And that's where people get, get hung up. So, um, no, have a very well-informed conscience and be a coward to it. Excellent. And, and do what you have to do. But the little tricks I play on myself when there's something I need to do that I don't want to do, I just tell myself, uh, I don't have to jump today. I can just be a jump refusal. Don't have to do it. I, I'll, I mean, I'll might get an article 15, it might destroy the whole operation. Who knows? You know, Chaplin decides not to jump. What's everybody else going to do? Right? You must know something we don't. Um, that could be that could be disastrous, but you know, I can be I can be horribly selfish and self-absorbed, right? So I'll just tell myself, you know what? I'm just not gonna do it. All right? And after I decide I'm not gonna do it, I feel so much better inside. I have this relief, right? And I just continue to tell myself I'm not going to do it because I get rigged up. Mm. I'll tell myself I'm not doing it because I walk on the plane. And I tell myself I'm not doing it. I don't have to. And I'm just not going to do it as I left, right, left, right, and right. Mm. Right? I remember coming back from work one day saying, I'm going go to go on an hour-long run uh, today. That's what I was supposed to do. That's what's on my training schedule. Just don't feel like doing it. I just don't want to do it. So you know what? I don't have to. I'm not going to do it. I'll do, and then I feel better. I drive home knowing I don't, I'm not going to go on this run. Then I just continue to tell myself I'm not going on this run if I put my running shoes on and lace them <laughs> up. But I don't have to do this. Not going to do it. As I take off, get to my turnaround point, I'm like, well, I guess I got to get home. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so many different instances um, wall road march. Yeah, this is 25 miles. Good great. I don't feel like doing one mile. So I'm going to quit. Going to quit when I get to that tree at the top of the hill. That's where I'm calling it quits. I get to the tree like, okay, I can quit now, but I think I can at least make it to that next tree. Mm-hmm. Go to the next tree, right? There's so much to be said in, in marriages. Uh, people that just want to quit their marriage is too hard. I'm like, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, not today, though. You can make it to next week, right? You can make it to the following week. Next thing we'll know, that season of, of, of discord in the marriage is over. And wow, I'm sure glad I stuck that out. You know, mm. we used to do that in OCS. Officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. Miserable. One well, of my buddies, we get together, and this is why I really learned this trick. We had this one guy that said, Hey guys, let's quit. I want to quit. I'm like, I want to quit too. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of this. Go home. Watch some TV. Uvo, sit on my couch. Okay. Hands in. We're quitting tomorrow. Every day we'd get up and say, Tomorrow, tomorrow we're quitting. Only going to do this one more day. Right? And when you do that, at some point your attitude changes a little bit. You have a better day, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, 
be a procrastinator when it comes to quitting. There you go. Be a, be a procrastinator when it comes to quitting. But yes. sure, go ahead and quit. Let's just procrastinate on that a little bit, though. Mm-hmm. You know? So uh, instead of being a procrastinator on the things you need, be a crass, procrastinator on the ones you shouldn't cut. There you go. There you go. Wise words. Father George, I got to get you out of here. Do you have anything to plug by any means at all? I, don't, I assume you don't have a lot of social media interactions, but if you do, okay. You don't seem plug, like you would. What, do you, what does that even mean? See, it's just usually I have, uh, if it's a priest, their their parish, will they'll you know give the website, stuff like that. Oh. Or author will give a book or links, things of that nature. Uh, if you need a military chaplain, you can go to the OCA website under chaplains. Okay. And everybody's listed there. And their their names, their contact information. I think my, my phone number's on there as well. Um, and um, you can contact me that way. Email address is on there. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll link to that then. So this will drop... During Holy Week. So, um, yeah, it's oh. going to be good. Thanks for doing this with me. Well, thank you. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Like I said, patreon.com slash counterflow. $5 or more per month get you into the special club. You can find everything for this show at counterflowpodcast.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. We've got the Telegram group. Grow, excuse me. I was going to say going strong, but it's growing strong as well. Join us in there. What else do I have for you guys? Let's see. Well, have a wonderful Holy Week if you are Orthodox and a great Pascha coming up. The all-night church service coming up Saturday night into Sunday morning. We're going to be like zombies on Sunday, aren't we? Well, I will see you guys soon. Have a good one. You get split in half, but I call them the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow Podcast.